Uh, okay, I think we we can start now. And um, I would uh, wel welcome you all uh, to the Water Drive uh, Policy Workshop. And uh, my name is Kaja Peterson, and I'm working as a program director for sustainable development. Uh, in the Stockholm Environment Institute Tallinn Center, Estonia. And uh, SCI Tallinn is, uh, uh, is a partner to uh, this Interreg Baltic Sea Region program project Water Drive. And uh, we are, among uh, other things, also uh, addressing several policy issues regarding the water management how to improve the water quality, how to maintain the biodiversity, how to maintain the soil fertility, uh, and uh, what can the governments, uh, the local governments, and what uh, the farmers can do about it. So we, we look uh, from, uh, to the water management issues from uh, different perspectives, uh, and uh, our Project Water Drive is, uh, is uh, both uh, working with the farmers in, in a grassroots level. Uh, we also um, work with the local governments, with the other actors, uh, but also with the regional and national governments. And uh, our project uh, has been in operation for uh, two years almost. And during that period, we have gathered quite a lot of interesting information and, and also shared the experiences across the Baltic Sea countries. Uh, all the Baltic Sea countries, uh, the EU member states and, and also Russia, uh, uh, with several partners uh, are involved. Uh, so we are covering uh, all the, the um, the countries of the Baltic Sea region, and uh, uh, because uh, it very much depends uh, of the efforts of all uh, the countries, uh, how to improve the, the environmental status uh, of the Baltic Sea. And uh, one issue that has uh, popped up uh, several times in our discussions and in our uh, studies uh, has been how to make uh, uh, the uh, common agricultural policy and different agri-environmental measures efficient enough uh, to, uh, to achieve uh, the good water quality, the good environmental status of the Baltic Sea, how to move from action-based uh, support system to result-based system because it uh, takes uh, the efforts uh, of several actors, several farmers, uh, several uh, local governments, regional authorities uh, uh, to, to act and uh, how to organize it uh, and, and how to motivate uh, the actors uh, to do so. Uh, this has uh, continuously been in our radar uh, of, uh, of the water drive project. And today we are going to look at uh, the result-based payments uh, also from, uh, from the experiences of uh, three countries. Uh, first, uh, I would uh, like to give floor to uh, Dr. Avelina Helm from Tartu University. And then secondly, to uh, Patrick Ruschel from uh, a very interesting project uh, going on in Ireland, uh, where uh, also the common or joint effort uh, of different landowners, farmers is needed in order to, uh, to uh, make a good uh, habitat, a quality habitat for a very uh, endangered species uh, bird mussel, and what we can learn from, from these experiences. 
And finally, uh, there will be an Austrian uh, presentation of an Austrian experience, how they have actually implemented the result-based payments already in their farming system, uh, what have been the challenges and, uh, and, and what can be uh, replicated in other EU member states under the common agricultural policy. This is what we are going to learn throughout uh, this uh, workshop. So hopefully the speakers will also uh, leave uh, some room for uh, questions and answers. And uh, I'm, I'm taking a close look at the chat box. Uh, please use the chat box for raising questions. Uh, and uh, so I will I will pick your questions from from there and uh, and I'm also the timekeeper. So I hope this will fit fit you all, and uh, we can start with uh, with the presentations. So please, uh, Avelina, the floor is yours. I hope the uh, the technical things will will. Um, uh, work out and please see whether you can share your slides with us. Hello everyone. I'm very glad to be here. So many, many people. I will try to share my correct screen at the moment. So Wait a minute and so, um, uh, I hope you see the presentation. Yes, yes, we do. Thank you. And uh, hopefully now also in the full <clears throat> screen, mm -hmm. in the large view. Yeah. Uh, so I am from Estonia. I work at the University of Tartu uh, and uh, I'm an ecologist uh, dealing with landscape scale issues of biodiversity and human interactions. So I mostly work uh, on uh, semi nature grasslands, but more also uh, now increasingly more also on conventional agricultural areas to see how to, how to link uh, how to move Estonian agriculture towards more sustainable one. Uh, I run a landscape biodiversity group that you will find un under this link. We have a lot of projects that we carry out uh, from uh, uh, landscape scale restoration to, um, uh, to citizen science projects to, uh, to conventional scientific research in landscape scale. Why uh, Kaya has asked me to uh, present here is uh, that uh, I am also involved in designing new CAP uh, period uh, schemes for Estonia. Uh, together with Kaya, we uh, we also uh, sit in the in the in this what is this called uh, the the board that uh, that approves or designs them, but, but also scientifically we have helped to design some of the schemes. And uh, from the beginning, I think I must uh, disappoint you because Estonia is not very advanced in, uh, in applying uh, uh, results-based schemes, but I will do my best to show what we have done and what we, we are planning to uh, do new period. So, uh, but maybe some of those are interesting to you nevertheless. Uh, when we look at Estonian CAP schemes uh, uh, from biodiversity perspective and also from, uh, from the interactions with the land uh, owners and the farmers, uh, they can be differentiated uh, to two uh, kind of broad schemes. One is uh, focusing on semi-natural grasslands uh, in Estonia, which is more in the borderline between agriculture and nature conservation as in elsewhere, I believe, but uh, that has been subsidized. Uh, the activities in semi-natural grasslands have been subsidized uh, from, uh, from uh, CAP uh, funds uh, over the last two periods. 
And the, the other ones are then uh, the <laughs> regular agri, agri environmental schemes for uh, where all the farmers uh, uh, participate or, or where the conventional farmers are more interested in how, how these are developed. So I, I also, because we have different experience in these two, uh, two schemes, I, I also present the, both of them a bit uh, to, to open, <clears throat> open up this these um, challenges that we have had. So regarding grasslands, our situation in Estonia is quite similar to uh, uh, to elsewhere in uh, Europe uh, that we have had a lot of uh, uh, kind of uh, traditionally managed, extensively managed uh, biodiverse grasslands uh, altogether in 19, uh, in the beginning of of 20th century, uh, we had one third of our uh, land area covered with different semi-natural grassland habitats. And uh, large part of them were wooded meadows, which have almost completely disappeared by now. And uh, this is the loss of, uh, of grasslands in, in Estonia over past 70 uh, to 100 years. Uh, but uh, what you can see here is uh, that we still have quite a lot of, uh, of grasslands compared to the overall area. It's, it's a bit uh, enhanced, the borders are a bit enhanced uh, for better visibility, but altogether we have uh, uh, around uh, 130,000 hectares of grasslands that would need this traditional management. But uh, overall we currently manage 35,000 hectares. And uh, well, this is the, we have quite good uh, information about the historical coverage and the dynamics of these grassland laws. So uh, altogether from 1.8 million hectares to around one, 120 to 130,000 hectares is the, is the loss of, uh, of habitats, as you know. Um, what is uh, different uh, to Estonia from other countries is that we have joint central system developed for, for managing semi-natural grasslands and developing schemes and applying and communicating with farmers uh, managing these uh, areas. So uh, I, I quickly only found the, uh, the figure showing the area of semi-natural grasslands that are managed uh, to 2017, and also I have managed to block the numbers, but it is 30,000 30, hectares was managed in 2017, and now we have increased to, to 35,000 hectares. And this uh, line shows the number of uh, farmers who, who carry out the management. And right now we have around 950 farmers who are involved in the schemes. And uh, the nationwide uh, scheme is such that first we have an action plan that kind of outlines the activities and our goals that are needed to achieve but uh, but then uh, we have centrally run in the uh, environmental board uh, that that is within the environmental ministry uh, they run uh, a land man managers uh, support group so there is uh, one central uh, group in Tallinn uh, that, uh, that keeps an eye on ev every development regarding semi-natural grasslands and then they are also, they have managers all over Estonia divided to four, four or five, I think four uh, regions, so in each region there are local uh, officials who uh, communicate with local farmers. So there is a good um, uh, and, and usually the knowledge regarding the problems of the farmers and, and the problems related to particular areas are monitored and already kind of known by these local managers. So the local managers are those who the farmer can call and, uh, and ask, ask advice. And, and they also have a bit of uh, uh, advisory, uh, they, they advise but they also control a bit, but they are not control organ themselves. The control organ is the, is the um, 
is the same organ who uh, pays out all the agricultural uh, subsidies. So they come every now and then and do the actual control of how the management has been carried out. According to this plan, we have uh, uh, action plan, we have set the uh, goals to reach somewhere, for example, we want to have 45,000 hectares uh, of, the, of these semi-natural grasslands managed by it <laughs> by this year, uh, but, uh, but we failed a bit, but, uh, but this was a long shot anyway, we were quite happy, we are quite happy with the actual 35,000 hectares at the moment, this, is, this has been a great work actually. And, um, and now we are setting the new goals for the new period uh, that um, uh, around 60,000 or half of the remaining areas should be managed by the end of the next period. Most of the schemes that we have had for semi-natural grasslands obviously as elsewhere have been action-based so far. Here is just an example of the current, currently uh, applying uh, schemes and their and their activities so it's uh, it's differentiated for wooded pastures and wooded meadows such as these uh, wooded meadow mowing is uh, actually the maximum number that you can uh, maximum subsidy that you can have for uh, for such herbaceous habitats uh, by current eu uh, regulations and uh, this is also very expensive activity because it uh, Due to the wood, <laughs> due to the trees, it's very hard to mow it and very laborious uh, activity. So uh, grazing and uh, grazing is cheaper, and also managing other grasslands, for example, flat plain meadows or uh, or just um, regular mesic grasslands uh, without trees is much cheaper. It's 150 euros to 85 euros per hectare, but still. Uh, Currently, we can say that these uh, rates have been more or less motivating, especially for uh, we have what we have seen is the decline of the of the uh, or the increase of the area that uh, each land manager has. So usually they tend to increase their uh, area of of the of the managed uh, managed grasslands because uh, some of them or around half of them are also doing other agricultural activities and management of semi-natural areas is kind of a support system that they can always uh, rely on as well, even if their other activities somehow uh, fail or, or, or the market is not so good for, let's say, crops that they grow, uh, then, then they know that they, uh, they have um, um, that the activities that they have carried out in the wooded meadows or other semi-natural areas are, are subsidized if they, if they do them correctly. And uh, during the last period, we had one kind of results-based scheme, which we called uh, coastal meadow top-up, uh, which uh, was um, uh, top-up payment uh, in addition to regular management payment that uh, that tried to uh, motivate farmers to maintain and manage and uh, kind of move coastal grasslands towards from from kind of this condition on the I don't know if you see my do you see my pointer as well from the from kind of overgrown uh, grass uh, grasslands in coastal areas to to this wader friendly. Uh, habitats that have open shoreline and low uh, low uh, grass uh, coverage, like well grazed, and uh, and that has no woody species that would uh, that would be suitable places for for predators uh, of these coastal birds. And uh, this is very much kind of hybrid uh, scheme that there was. Um, not not results based per se because uh, because there were pre-selected sites that would have this potential to be uh, managed this way first around seven thousand and five hundred hectares of potential sites and within these potential sites if the management uh, was uh, carried out suitably so that it would result in uh, in 
uh, more than 75% open coastline, no woody species, and these uh, wet areas within the grassland would be managed and at least 45 hectare wide and large complex would be formed. So these were the requirements that farmers must commit themselves to and then they get the top up payment. But how, yeah, how they achieve it in a way that that was their own uh, business at the, at the time. But this wasn't very popular scheme uh, altogether out of the 7,500 hectares, uh, only well, less than 1,000 uh, were kind of uh, signed into or, or it, wasn't, it wasn't very popular because farmers were actually intimidated by the, uh, by the requirements, especially uh, regarding the, uh, the, the grazing uh, of the water line area and kind of committing themselves into, into this. Uh, that wasn't there. Um, so, and also maybe the build up of the, of the scheme that, uh, that you first had to commit uh, to the scheme and then uh, had no chance to say that, uh, no, I, I, it, didn't, it didn't work out so, so well. Uh, during new period, uh, we uh, we have now more or less uh, decided what what we want to do during new period for semi natural grasslands, and first that the reg these regular action based payments that uh, have proved more or less to be uh, successful and allow this kind of large quantities of area to be managed. Uh, they will continue uh, more or less similarly. We will make them uh, much looser a bit uh, regarding the requirements for the farmers. So trying to motivate people to take up new areas, areas uh, more willingly. willingly. And uh, the coastal grassland top up the same way there uh, favoring uh, Top up will also continue, and now we try to introduce the point uh, system uh, that can be taken voluntarily uh, into these areas. That would also be a top up to the regular uh, scheme payment. Uh, but this is uh, I can't show you the exact uh, methods because during this uh, we are just currently developing this point system, but we are really much relying on the. Uh, on the Ireland uh, and uh, Great Britain examples of uh, of the point systems that they have used for for their grasslands, where uh, farmer and expert monitoring before and after will be carried out. So uh, uh, just by visiting the site and and uh, having the points based on positive and negative indicator species and easily recognizable protected species, for example, the orchids that, uh, that will form as uh, larger, uh, will give more points and have uh, our sign of the positive indicator species. And also for some habitats, uh, because we have a number of different habitat types, uh, the ve vegetation structure and presence of, of litter uh, is the uh, uh, is, are the inputs that will form this point system that we will apply. Next year we will test it together with the farmers uh, that have already lined up for this. Uh, we, we here can enjoy a bit of uh, interest from the farmers themselves. They have formed quite active groups of, uh, of people who communicate within themselves and form uh, also some uh, NGOs, there are two NGOs that very actively uh, kind of uh, express the interests of the, of the managers of seminatural grasslands. And uh, we have a big 10-year uh, life EP project that just started. And one goal of the project is to develop, um, uh, develop uh, not only this uh, kind of results-based schemes, this is one tiny part of it, but one uh, part of the project is also to 
to make our uh, semi-natural grassland um, managing system that we currently have, uh, that I, that I describe, describe that we currently have, where we have this central land managers uh, and they advise uh, people, we want to make it uh, stronger and uh, more, uh, even more kind of um, farmer based or, or in, in, in better contact with, with farmer uh, because currently uh, these people are a bit uh, overworked and, uh, and they, they don't have, they have other obligations as well, like administrative obligations. Uh, they, they, they often don't have sufficient time to actually advise based on what, what should be done on this site or that site or what would be good. So we really want to know uh, design as a kind of structure for our semi-natural grassland management that would um, that would have a very solid kind of advisory system for each farmer that would need that and and that they can always if they walk in their grassland they can take a phone and call and somebody would uh, would come and they can talk to and have a have a good advice and have also direct contact to. Uh, to the system uh, that uh, that uh, if if things are done the way that uh, they are advised they would would not be penalized later by the by the control uh, organs who come and uh, and maybe think otherwise so having this kind of uh, better interaction between state uh, different uh, organs and the and the farmers and uh, we are currently developing also a new action plan, which should start already next year, but we are kind of due to the political reasons here in Estonia, we are quite in the, uh, we are still making it, but it is soon ready. And now I wanted to introduce uh, the, I'm sorry, do you have any questions regarding the semi-natural grasslands or I will, Kaya, what do you think I will take them all later or? Uh Yes, there are there are a couple of uh, questions I can read from the chat box, but maybe it's uh, it's worthwhile of collecting them and then yeah. have a discussion at the end. Good, um, because I can't can't see them at the moment. It's my screen is blocked with this uh, with this presentation. And but um, now I wanted to introduce you kind of the other <laughs> agri environmental schemes that uh, that go out of this. Uh, one group of people who manage semi-natural areas. One of our goal has always been to get all the farmers to value semi-natural areas in the, in the region. But maybe if you remember also from the map, uh, we have such unfortunate or kind of such situation that the semi-natural grasslands are more in the regions where ac other uh, agricultural activities are hindered, the soils are too shallow or they are, the landscapes are too complex. And then we have these very active and intensive agricultural regions in the central part of Estonia, where farming is very intense and the landscapes are very suitable for high intensity farming systems. And they, uh, the landscapes are, can be really uh, homogeneous and monotonous. Uh, so eventually uh, we, would, we would like to see the situation where, where the farmers also in these regions uh, that are mostly focused on very intensive wood production, that they would also take up some of the uh, semi-natural grassland manage, management, but at the moment at least it is often a bit uh, divided. So there are, they, there are these real farmers that like they want to call, call themselves or some, and then there are these people who manage semi-natural grasslands, which, which is a very artificial distinction, but that is, uh, that's some, how the uh, bad uh, thing that, uh, that our farmers have developed such kind of uh, distinctions themselves as well. But the, so regarding other environmental, agri-environmental schemes, so that uh, we have been 
building it up so that there, are, there is a semi-natural grassland scheme uh, and it is one of the agri-environmental agri schemes, but it just, uh, it is, uh, it is so distinctive that it's discussed also separately and uh, not in the same uh, board as, as the other uh, environmental schemes are. So uh, usually uh, we had no actually no results based schemes during this period that just is ending. And for the new period, we have one really cool scheme that I, I really like and that I wanted to introduce as well, uh, which is uh, uh, based on uh, maintenance of ecosystem services in the farmland and it's a landscape scale approach. So uh, first I have to introduce the, well uh, you are probably all aware of, uh, of the importance of landscape scale structure or landscape structure and landscape elements obviously in, in the agriculture landscapes and, and the amount of either uh, semi-natural areas in the farming uh, systems or farm, farming landscapes or the amount of uh, ages and age density uh, that would come from uh, from little islets within the fields or from the flower strips or permanent uh, grass strips and so on uh, that they would uh, they both kind of this landscape diversity influences and supports different ecosystem services like pollination or pest control that, uh, that farmers need as well. And uh, we have just finished or are about to finish uh, this month uh, Estonian mapping and, assess mapping and assessment of ecosystems and their services during this uh, European MIAS project where all of the uh, member countries, member states um, are obliged to, to map their ecosystems and their, and their ecosystem services. We have just finishing it and during uh, this project we have, uh, uh, we have done a lot of <laughs> work. But uh, what most uh, import or importantly for agricultural areas, um, so first we have mapped the condition of each habitat in Estonia, not only protected areas, uh, like everything, all the land area that we have, we have mapped their ecological condition. And for fields, for agricultural areas, we have uh, used uh, different uh, indicators that would uh, reveal their condition. So uh, we use this point system for each field. Here you can see just one region with fields and uh, you can see these are different. They can be either permanent grasslands or, or cultivated uh, areas. Uh, for each field we developed a point system based on presence of landscape elements and the coverage of landscape elements. So uh, for each landscape element, we gave an influence radius. So if you would have a, one uh, field, uh, one uh, kind of islet or east island within the field, uh, then uh, based on the movement or kind of average movement of, uh, of uh, let's say insects or carabids or spiders, uh, or pollinators to the field, uh, we kind of gave uh, this uh, more or less average uh, influence radiuses for each uh, island or each other landscape element. And uh, this is uh, this was one gr group of uh, points where that field could get, and the other group of points came from uh, agricultural practices. So if it was uh, uh, if uh, if it was uh, organically managed field, it got more points than, than if it was uh, regular uh, intensive uh, intensively managed area, or it got very little points or no or minus points when uh, when it was intensively managed area in let's say organic peat soils, which we uh, tend to have here and as well still, and that are managed 
so uh, uh, based on this point system which is uh, which i don't have yeah, time to go into so much detail at the moment we uh, we got a kind of condition class for each field in estonia so having um, higher classes or lower classes here you can see that the a class is the deep green everything is kind of like perfect in in these fields and uh, less perfect in in these fields uh, when we look at our overall distribution of these condition classes then uh, and this is the whole estonia and these are dif our different counties but for whole estonia you can see that uh, that the A class, the, the best class, it's actually very uh, little, it's, it's not very much of those uh, fields. And also A and B classes, uh, B is also quite good, are uh, less, less than 20% of our total area of, uh, of agricultural areas. And uh, there was a lot of uh, fields or agricultural areas that got very for uh, point score, they were both badly managed or the, don't, didn't have a kind of environmental, environmentally friendly practices, nor did they have uh, enough landscape elements to kind of mitigate those. So our first uh, aim was to get this condition to somehow into the new CAP scheme as well, to uh, to start um, to uh, to start motivating farmers to increase their point system in the fields and increase uh, their condition and get the payments based on on this condition. The, that didn't work out. Uh, that was that didn't uh, people didn't like it, <laughs> uh, but uh, but now we have a but what did work out and what will be applied is uh, is percentage uh, coverage of landscape elements that is seen as a as a percentage of the field that is covered by ecosystem services. So uh, for example, here you can see a large field. Do you see my pointer as well? Not if you see, yeah. Uh, that uh, has is almost 200 hectares, and within here is a little islet. And and even if you would want to have natural pest control, or you would grow a pollination needing crop in here, you would not have this service in your field because physically it is impossible for for uh, let's say uh, pests of or kind of natural enemies of the pests to move to the field even if they live in this tiny part of uh, of the islet or even if they manage to uh, overwinter there and uh, and form populations that would move into the field and uh, but it is easy to plow easy to uh, manage so it is only fair that uh, that these areas that have very low coverage of landscape elements, thus also low coverage of uh, or low maintenance of these ecosystem services, that they uh, that they get uh, smaller payments than those that are different. Uh, so we uh, for each landscape element uh, we gave. Uh, different influence radius based on literature review and uh, and the studies that we have done here as well uh, of how far the the uh, animals move oh, the time is going so quickly uh, and uh, and so uh, so the idea is or not the idea but the scheme is such that if you have uh, more than 90% uh, coverage with uh, with those ecosystem services, you would get an uh, extra extra payment uh, in top of the current uh, scheme funds that you would apply for. And if you have 60% up to 60 or more than 60%, you would have uh, 
kind of extra. So two layered uh, distinction, like a little bit more and, and more, more. Here you can just see. Avelina, some... if I can ask you, yes, to, to leave some time also for questions because the. Yeah, the I'm, are... I'm just finishing, I'm just going through some pictures of how these landscape elements work and how they see seem and how they can, uh, what we really wanted to put in as well is the scheme that would motivate farm, that would help farmers to also create new landscape elements so that you would move from this uh, field to this that would have this 60% coverage, but unfortunately this didn't uh, go in. So uh, so now they, they're, the kind of the result-based scheme is so that if they are motivated enough to move into towards the 60% coverage, they would do additional landscape elements that would lift them to the new, uh, to this payment, to be eligible for the payment. So that is, I think that is my last, uh, yeah, that is my last slide here. <laughs> I, did, I did want to tell about, we did a little survey as well among the farmers and asked them, uh, listed them around uh, 20 different some very realistic and some very wild results-based schemes and ask their opinions, but I, I don't think I have time to show. Uh, I, I don't have slides for those. I can only say what, what we do did. Mm -hmm. And I have to say that I only, yes, I have, uh, yeah, I have been talking too long. Oh. No, th thank you, Avelina. It has been very, very interesting, I suppose. Since our project is, is looking at those uh, co-benefits or, or multiple benefits arising from biodiversity conservation and, and, uh, and water, water protection, in your opinion, uh, which uh, schemes or measures work the best? I mean, where the biodiversity conservation and, and water management or water protection uh, work together? And, and have the best results, um, what would you suggest? Um, actually, um, yes, I'm thinking here in the kind of the landscape scale that, uh, that the same schemes that would motivate uh, di diversification of the landscape would also can, can be designed this way that the, that the very large influence is put on the on the buffer areas of the water bodies, or uh, or that would uh, that would uh, yeah kind of weigh up uh, uh, the the schemes or the actions that would uh, that would result in well protected waterways. But one thing that we asked from farmers, one results based scheme, so to say, <laughs> which they didn't like, they said that it is like prison. Uh, was that uh, how would they feel about if the payments of agri environmental well all all the cap payments would be linked to um, catchment condition for all the farmers in the catchment so if the catchment condition is uh, is not good and it is it does not have point sources but it is this uh, Diffuse. <laughs> yes, diffuse sources, then all the farmers in the catchment, which we have very well defined here in Estonia as well, would lose uh, some of their support funds until they, they kind of pinpoint uh, these people or these farming systems that, would, that are mostly responsible for these diffuse systems diffuse poll uh, pollution, because usually it is so that, uh, that there are there are still even this diffuse uh, pollution would come from limited amount of bad farming systems in the catchment and and so that they would quickly point out those <laughs> or quickly find those who would be responsible for but they they really they really thought that this is a bad idea and maybe this okay so um, I'm picking uh, some comments and, and questions for you from the chat box uh, there is a question coming from Lithuania. Justas is asking uh, regarding uh, the, the grazing versus uh, mowing uh, and also the, the, the rate of the payment uh, that seemed to be higher for mowing than for grazing. 
uh, what would be your comment on that? Why, why we have such a system? Yes, uh, um, we encourage mowing uh, in wooded meadows very much at the moment because uh, it, it is easier to graze first. And we have a lot of historical wooded meadows where we know that they have been mown for hundreds of years. And we, we also know that this mowing and grazing have different uh, impacts on, on, on these grasslands. Uh, they, they change the species composition. And these particular wooded meadows that we, that we encourage to be mown, they have been mown for a really long time. And, uh, and that, is, uh, the, that is the reason why we have gone through this. Uh, it is very painful, I must say. This is hindering a lot uh, our uptake of management of wooded meadows because we mostly allow only mowing in, in most areas uh, because it is hard. But now we, yeah, we have probably had to move towards grazing as well. Mm -hmm. So there is another question from from our uh, Lithuanian colleagues <clears throat> about a possible uh, or potential conflict between, let's say, forest policy and and farming policy, or or um, this opening up of yeah. landscapes. Yeah. Uh, would you comment on that. Yeah, first uh, from the last uh, question as well, we have the GIS layer that is visible to farmers where they can declare where they can where they can see which are not managed areas yet and they can apply for those and this is a system that the state runs. This is, uh, uh, but uh, yes, uh, very much I believe currently we have until now for the past five to seven years we have uh, started to um, very strongly restore uh, habitats, grassland habitats, they often had to be restored from the forests. And there is first one conflict is between uh, uh, kind of mental uh, stage of uh, people not wanting to uh, cut down trees, even if they are young and monotonous pine trees that have been always mostly, for example, planted uh, to the previous grasslands. Uh, but this we have more or less overcome, but now with this climate uh, issue uh, coming, uh, we now already have these cases where in one hand we restore uh, grasslands and there is as valuable grassland, but maybe not declared in the state uh, system, uh, neighboring it that is uh, put into the afforestation uh, kind of uh, line <laughs> and then this is very very bad uh, i feel that we are in this uh, gray zone at the moment where uh, where this afforestation for climate measure is coming quickly again but we haven't managed to yet say that no no it can't be done everywhere it can't be done at the expense of the open areas uh, but i hope we will i hope we will reach there but uh, then I see there is a question for influence radius. Yes, how, how is that determined? Yes, so this was uh, determined by the uh, literature review and based on kind of uh, uh, more expert based uh, assessment of how high quality uh, habitats would each landscape element be. For example, uh, stone walls are also landscape elements, but their radius is smaller than, uh, than for white permanent uh, buffer strips or grass strips. And, uh, and the historical semi-natural grasslands have the widest uh, coverage because we really want to motivate them to be close uh, and valued near fields. Uh, so, uh, and they are like rich source of species to the landscape. And uh, so it is based on literature and expert view, a bit of a mix there. And we try to be rather, uh, rather not overly optimistic, but uh, but quite conservative. Uh, so in, in this, for example, uh, beetles, uh, uh, ground beetles can travel up to 60 to 100 uh, meters. Uh, but uh, 100 meters will only be made by few groups, but most of them only move 50 meters or so. So we set like okay, 50 or 70 meters. So, and uh, 
yeah, but the thing is that it's not the landscape elements there per se, but but the inf but their influence radius that starts to count, and we want that uh, and their influence radius is the indicator of of the uh, ecosystem services and uh, that is yes it's not uh, doubling because they don't get the payments for the landscape elements they only get the payments uh, for they don't get the payments they have obligation to keep them but what we want to motivate is to is the obligation to or or is the motivation to kind of increase them to the point where they would be eligible to this 60% uh, extra payment, for example. And um, and that uh, the other one is thinking that why is not uh, doubling is I can't recall at the moment. Yeah. There is probably a question behind uh, Eustace's uh, question that uh, remember, we had this 50, 53 requirement uh, in a wooded meadow, and if there was more, it was uh, not regarded uh, eligible for uh, for payments. Uh, Justas is referring probably also that there is a need to clear bushes and, and so on, and uh, and whether the rules will be changing. Uh, yeah, maybe you would like to comment on that. Yeah, uh, no, I. We are constantly also clashing with these uh, uh, rules here as well, especially because we also want us, our seminature grasslands to be eligible for the cap payments. But this is even more harder than, than just going with the landscape elements in the, uh, because, uh, because not all of our uh, seminature grasslands Fall, fall under this 53 uh, or 103 uh, um, kind of requirement. And uh, also, unfortunately, in the new period, many of our grasslands will not be eligible for, for the cap, uh, uh, cap fund. Uh, so I also heard that they would be changing those rules, but now I also heard that they would be not changing the rules. So, yeah. And uh, you somehow measure uh, I'm, I'm reading the second question by Justas here. Whether it has been also communicated and, and worked together with the farmers or or is it uh, been an, just an academic exercise? Uh, did I work in with the farmers uh, and giving the consultation? You ask, or sorry, hey. Yeah, yeah but, can, uh, can can I yeah, maybe please. explain? Yeah, just uh, do you? I mean, do you go with the farmers on their farms and tell them that you can increase, for example, hedgerows here and and maybe a tree there and something more there, or you just? I mean, it's just a payment to su sustain what it is already. Yeah, what we really wanted to have uh, is the payment uh, or, or the system where people first uh, either get the payment also for what they have, because I think there needs, it needs to be valued also differently that uh, the people who go through the farming in a complex situations where they don't have these 200 hectare fields, uh, that they, they would be their effort uh, of managing the farming systems that are harder to manage would be would be mitigated or or um, or supported but uh, but what we really really wanted also within this scheme at the beginning of the of the scheme discussions uh, we also had uh, the, the creation of landscapes like we had extra scheme of creating good agricultural landscapes so that person a farmer could apply uh, for uh, for an expert advice and uh, mapping of their own uh, field systems based on exactly what you said that here should be here is your wet place anyway here you should keep uh, this uh, uh, landscape uh, or here you should create a kind of permanent wetland uh, here is a good place for hedgerow this way if you put them uh, uh, kind of this and this way, spatially, 
uh, you would uh, achieve this and this coverage with with these ecosystem services so that uh, this scheme that we now will have would also be complemented by another scheme that would help farmers to move towards these landscapes but this didn't uh, unfortunately again go well within our collective mind mm -hmm. Do we know the, the share of the budget of, uh, of managing uh, semi-natural grasslands? I mean, is it, uh, no. At the moment, no, at the new, for new period. This is uh, an active discussion at the moment. Uh, usually it is so that it is a heavy fight uh, between uh, regular schemes and uh, semi-natural grassland management because, as I I told previously many of the farmers feel that uh, that uh, that if we support semi-natural grass and management the money is taken away from the uh, from the honest food food production that uh, that they they, uh, they see so it's but I, I can't say the share at the moment I can't also say the share about previous a period I can look it up but I don't have it in mind it's it's smaller it's small compared to the all overall funds obviously and and perhaps uh, finally and just to link up with the next uh, presentation since you were working and and uh, and uh, introducing us uh, how the ecosystem services uh, on a on a on a mainland uh, and uh, and how to preserve them and, and how to motivate the, the landowners, the, the farmers to do so. But uh, regarding the ecosystem services of the aquatic uh, environment, uh, the, the, the water bodies, uh, the rivers and streams and uh, canals, uh, do you think that this kind of methodology that you have developed uh, for the mainland could also be progressed and, and uh, applied to, to the to the water habitats as well? Uh, maybe it can, uh, uh, but uh, yes, we have, I, I have been so much focused on the land here that I even can't uh, wrap my head at the moment around it, but, but, but definitely uh, it, these kind of aspects can be done and can be applied to, to water bodies. Kaya, if I may, uh, can I show the Rohemeter as well? I forgot to show this. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, I will share my, if you have time, I will have to run because I have a lecture. Shortly. <laughs> <laughs> I have a lecture starting at 12, but uh, but uh, as we have now all moved to Zoom. Uh, the lecture starts at 12.15, so I think uh, nobody is coming at the actual lecture room today. So I don't have to leave my computer before. 12.15 but uh, or 12.14 but I would like to share if you have a moment uh, our really um, cool application that we really like and 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 Avelina if you could put this uh, link to our chat box then people can can uh, uh, do you see my screen again now yes, yes can you can you put the link rohemeter.de yourself because I can't uh -huh, okay but anyway, this is the this is the landscape biodiversity estimation tool for Estonia, which we developed here in University of Tartu in my work group and Melis's Melis Pertel's work group, macroecology work group. This is uh, uh, for everyone to estimate how nature friendly is the landscape surrounding you and what is uh, well with it and what is wrong with it and what you should be doing. So here, if you press measure. Uh, in a few days time, actually, there will be also an English meter in the uh, address greenmeter.eu. You can write this as well, Kaya, but it doesn't work yet, but it will start to work in within a week. So he, here is Estonia and you, uh, you can play around with it. You can select any place in Estonia. For example, our uh, heavily agricultural areas are here uh, in the central part and also here in Tartu region, but if you click on any location you and click Mõda, which is measure, you will get the estimate of what is uh, and description of what is going on in this particular landscape around this click point. Here you can read that mostly here are agricultural lands, the landscape suitability for uh, uh, for 
biodiversity is low or worrying is the word here but you have found but there are some uh, uh, sorry but there are some uh, protected species found in this place this is and here you can say what is the problem that the regular intensive land is not good and uh, it is it has too little diversity landscape diversity and what you can do and it's very but you can also have the semi similar estimates from the other areas here is for example everything is good this is one uh, uh, there are protected species uh, the forest here is well managed uh, it is it has the uh, valuable forest habitat within this radius and this is actually it seems to be like a protected area as well and there is a longer description of what should what should you be doing in this particular landscape and it also works in cities and uh, it gives a diff kind of different estimate in the in the city areas based on on the different um, kind of let's say let's put it here that here um, uh, everywhere it weighs uh, this suitability for biodiversity based on kind of the potential that you could have based on but you are in a city, you wouldn't expect the same kind of biodiversity support as you would in a good forest. Uh, but uh, but based on based on the location where you are, uh, the the potential is how much the potential is re realized. So it would be perfect city if it would be hundred. It would be a perfect agricultural land if it would be hundred. Mm -hmm. So it is based on an algorithm that uh, where we weigh. Uh, the impact of different positive and negative uh, input variables. So we have more than 60 GIS layers underneath it that uh, where we have applied uh, their uh, kind of uh, weight to the overall, overall uh, kind of support for biodiversity. So for example, um, if, uh, I don't, if I don't know, growth forests increase the value, uh, recent clear cuts decrease the value. So mm -hmm. and based on these 60 kind of the combinations of these 60 different GIS layers and their values, uh, this is how this, uh, this overall score is formed. Mm -hmm. Okay, <laughs> well, I think we have to now give yeah, the floor sorry. to the next <laughs> yeah. speaker, but uh, I have a uh, the, the links to our chat box so uh, I hope that uh, the, the I to, yeah sorry I, yeah I have to run and I, I thank you so much for inviting me I, yeah, I, I hope to look at the recording yeah. yeah and thank you Avelina for your presentation as well I think uh, it was uh, it was a good introduction to our workshop so thank you so much uh, but as I, as I said uh, now we we move uh, to uh, to Ireland uh, and uh, and to learn the experiences of how to to manage the water uh, or aquatic habitats uh, for a very special species and, and what the farmers can do about it. So please, uh, uh, please, Patrick, floor is yours. Okay, uh, thank you, thank you, Kaya. Um, I'm just trying to share my screen here. Can you see that? Yes, yes it works well. Okay. Um, look, thanks very much for inviting me to speak. Uh, Avelina, I found that uh, presentation very interesting, very different landscapes that I'm working in compared to your more intensive farming. Um, so, uh, as I say, I'm working as project manager on the Pearl Mussel Project. It's a European innovation partnership. Uh, we're de developing a results-based agri-environmental program for an aquatic target species. So this is the big innovation of this project. There's been many examples of results-based programs in Ireland and elsewhere where they're targeting terrestrial habitats, whereas this is something very different where we're trying to relate the quality of the land to the result and, and the target in the water quality and the, the habitat of a, of a freshwater pearl mussel, which occur in these pristine water bodies in the west of Ireland. Um, so, as I say, it's a 10 million euro uh, 
pro program. It's funded through the Rural Development Program and uh, the Department of Agriculture here in Ireland. Um, we commenced work in this in 2018, so we're just two years into the program. Uh, the first year was taken up with designing and developing our methods, and the second year onwards, we've been working uh, actively with farmers in the catchments, and we pay them an annual payment based on the results based. Uh, of results that they're achieving during the year. So we are aiming, or as I say, our aim is to design and administer the program and to improve, obviously the main target here is to improve conditions for the freshwater pearl mussel. A six year program, it's locally adapted. So all of our measures and all of our, 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 our target, it's, it's very much targeted at the local landscape. So the West of Ireland is quite different from the East of Ireland. It's very much a peatland dominated landscape, extremely wet conditions, but I, I'll speak a bit more about that in a minute. But just to say that the whole thing is very much locally based, but also locally adapted so that it suits the landscape, but it also the measures suit the landscape, but they also suit the types of farming that pre predominate in these areas. Uh, we're working very closely with the different uh, stakeholders, includes ourselves, which is the project team. There's about six of us working on the program. And then there's also farm advisors who are really doing a lot of the advisory services and doing the assessments and doing the scoring. And then obviously the farmers themselves who are the key uh, stakeholder who we work very closely with. Um, just, I suppose, what, what gave rise or what was the driver towards developing this program? Um, the, West, uh, the habitats in the west of Ireland, uh, they're very much threatened and, uh, and in declining condition, I suppose. Recent reporting on EU Natura 2000 lands has shown that most of the habitats in these areas, such as blanket bog or peatland and uh, grasslands, are in bad status and declining. Uh, freshwater pearl mussel itself, it's an endangered species. It's one of the most endangered species on earth. It's 80% um, of the national population occurs in the areas we're working on. Uh, and again, the overall status and trend for this species in Ireland is bad and declining. So it's very much uh, uh, under pressure and threatened. It's also a, an extremely good indicator of the, the overall quality of the landscape and, and the water courses. It would be the first thing to disappear if there's any pressures on water quality or on uh, on the river systems. Uh, general freshwater quality is also on, in, in decline here in Ireland. We've had a tenfold decline in pristine waters um, as required by this species, and that's since the late 1980s. And even in the last few days, the Environmental Protection Agency here have again uh, given a kind of a status of the environment in Ireland, and there's continuing declines and pressures on our freshwater habitats and a lot of that is emanating from agriculture, unfortunately. So just to talk about the species for a few minutes, our main target, Margaritifera margaritifera, it's, um, it's, uh, it's, as I say, it's critically endangered throughout uh, its range um, and it's in overall bad and, and declining status. It's not only an Irish problem. This is the same throughout Western Europe where the species occurs. It's, uh, it's under pressure throughout due to land use. Um, and just as kind of, uh, I'm not sure how familiar you might be with the species, but it's got an extremely complex life cycle. And this is one of the problems it faces is that there's a, a very sensitive stage of their life cycle when they're juvenile mussels. Uh, they live for up to 140 years, the individual mussels. They're an, an indicator of ex exceptional water quality. They only occur in pristine conditions. Uh, eight catchments, so there's eight catchments that we're working in, which are small catchments in the west of Ireland, and they sustain 80% of the Irish population. So they're very much looked upon as a priority areas to work in to make sure that we can continue to, uh, to conserve the species there and that it continues to, to recruit juveniles. Uh, just to talk about the, the life cycle for a second, as adult mussels, they live on the bed of the river. They're not like the sea mussels where they're attached onto the sediment. They're just sitting there like stones in a place by the bed of the river. Um, the adult female mussels release larvae during the summertime. These are known as glochidia. For them to survive, they have to attach onto the gills of a, of a salmon or trout living in the water body. And then they have to live there on the on the gills of the salmon or the trout, where there's a high high level of oxygen present all the time. They live there for about a year, and they develop into juvenile mussels. After about a year, they drop off the salmon or trout, and then 
where they drop off, they also have to have exceptionally clean sediment to, to live in or to survive as juvenile mussels. It has to be very oxygen rich and there can't be any too many sediment or there has to be a lot of oxygen available in the, in that gravel or sandy layers in the river. They bury into the, as juveniles, they bury into the bed of the river about five centimeters down and they live there for five years in the bed of the river. So this is the real critical period when they're most vulnerable to, to decline that you have to have that high oxygen environment present for the entire five years for these mussels to survive that critical period. And then after five years, they come up to the surface of the bed of the river and live throughout the other 140 years to, and they'd be filtering water obviously the whole time during that period. So that's one of the important ecosystem services they'd be providing. Um, that's just a picture showing them there living in the bed of the river. They've, they, they inhale the water and take out the food particles and exhale the water again after. But I suppose the key pressures to this species is, is flow. These species, uh, this, these populations can only survive where the flow regime is quite stable in that there isn't uh, massive um, high flows and not very, not very low flows. So it's a very regulated flow environment. Generally, the rivers where that sustain them in Ireland have a lake at the at the upper part of the catchment, and this feeds the river. So that keeps the flow, that kind of helps to regulate the flow. But obviously, drainage and land drainage and all that has an effect here and can alter the flow sufficiently to be a significant pressure for the mussels. And in the areas we're working in, I think flow is probably one of the bigger pressures. So and so therefore, drainage and that of land drainage to facilitate agriculture is one of the big issues we're trying to address sediment coming off the land so sediment losses from land can be a significant pressure on them and also it can uh, it deteriorates the gravels and the sands on the bed of the river and prevents oxygen getting in so the juveniles can't survive also nutrients nutrient input if there's too much fertilizer or organic nutrients getting into the rivers then you get an increased algal growth and again you deplete oxygen making it difficult for them to survive um, so I, I think that's it. I've already spoken about the conservation that there is so endangered and, and that we're concentrating on the, the best remaining populations in Ireland and probably Western Europe. Uh, this is a healthy population of mussels where you've got a different size, uh, different size classes throughout. So you've got juveniles and adults. Unfortunately, in most Irish rivers and most European rivers, you might have some older adults, but no juveniles. Therefore, they're virtually extinct and it's only a matter of time before they become extinct. But in our the places where we're working, you do still have this good distribution of size classes. That's uh, them on the bed of the river, basically. Uh, that, that, that's very typical habitat that they occur in. So I suppose just to, just to move on, it's uh, one of the big challenges we have for the species. And I suppose our specialists would have been telling us when we started off that, look, we have to tell the farmers that the wetter, the better, which is a very difficult message to give to farmers who have been trying to dry the land for so long. But that, that's the reality of it. If we want to say sustain these populations, we need to sustain the slow releases of water into the rivers from the land. Um, and it, it makes it quite a difficult message to sell. Um, it has to be within the farmer's control, like I, I was interested in Avelina's comments earlier about the catchment based bonus payment and, and the potential for something like that, which is in the back of our minds. But one of the difficulty with something like that is there's also other land uses like forestry giving rise to pressures in these areas. And I think it would be unfair on the farmers if, if they weren't getting their payments due to the the activities of a different land use or even different sector in, in the catchment. So that, that's one of the things we had to consider. It has to be within the farmer's control. Um, incentivize, uh, uh, and one of the other things is we can't ignore any parts of the farm. On a terrestrial habitat, you can say, oh, we've got the best areas over here. We're not interested in the intensive agricultural parts of the farm. Whereas we have to take those into consideration because those areas are likely to be the ones giving rise to the impacts on, on, the, on the water quality. Um, and then that, that, that gives rise, obviously, we have to do a whole farm approach and also a kind of a catchment scale. Unless we have enough farmers uh, working with farmers in the catchment, we need a critical threshold of enough farmers working in a catchment that we're addressing the issue. I suppose one of the other things with this target species, and it's clear, you know, a lot of people ask, well, how do you monitor the water quality? So that, that is a difficulty you, to issue a payment based on water quality would be extremely difficult to measure something like that. So to, to overcome that issue, we've, we're relating the management of the land to the water quality. 
So the eight catchments we're working in, very high rainfall, uh, over two metres per year. 35% um, of the EU population of freshwater pearl mussels occur in these areas. So these are the catchments in the west and southwest of Ireland. We're based down here in the southwest in County Kerry, but there's others up here in, in Connemara and, and the northwest. Um, as I say, it's peat-based soils, uh, extensive agriculture, it's not very intensive, um, mixed cattle and sheep systems. Uh, we've got everything ranging from mountains to lowlands. Um, land ownership is another consideration. Most of it is privately owned land, so we're dealing with individual farmers who own the land, but there are other commonage areas where there's shared ownership and, and that gives rise to its own difficulties. I suppose we've got a group of farmers who have a shared ownership over an individual parcel of land. Uh, the areas are typically designated as Natura 2000 lands, uh, although we have some areas that are not officially designated. They're, most of them are designated as Natura 2000. So just to uh, bring it back to basics, I suppose the results-based approach, it's all about the payment being linked to the quality of the biodiversity. Higher the quality, higher the, the value, the higher the payment level. There's a lot of advantages to this. And I think a big thing is the increased cost effectiveness. You're paying for the result, therefore you're not wasting money on something that you're not wasting environmental money on, on something that isn't being delivered at the, at the farm level. Uh, it's targeted and locally adapted. Um, and there's a lot of flexibility that for the farmer in these systems. It's very much about trying to motivate them, as, as Evelina was saying, or incentivizing them to improve. And, you know, it, 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 a key thing to the rollout of these things is having that engagement with the farmer and trying to upskill them and explain to them exactly what it's all about and what it is we're asking them to deliver. Um, so, I mean, that's just an, an idea of the, the, the way the, the payments work, but as your quality goes up, your payment level goes up. So we have a point system. We, we uh, assess every individual land parcel on the farm. We give it a score out of zero up to 10, 10 being the highest score, zero being the lowest score. And then that's done using a simple scorecard uh, approach where we're looking at different habitats and indicator species. Uh, structure and also agricultural pressures all give rise to this score out of 10. Um, so that's done on each individual plot on, on the farm. Uh, this, this system was, I suppose, in Ireland anyway, was developed very much around the limestone landscape in the Burren. And uh, I think he'd, some of you would well be familiar with this, where they're paying for flower rich meadows and they pay a higher, a higher, a higher payment for your, your grasslands or your, your uh, limestone pavement. Um, that's just the burren area, but that, that we very much, I suppose our program was to look at the burren system and adapt it to try and target water quality in different targets, but the same overall approach. As I said, the key thing here is getting the message across to the farmers. Every farmer will tell you what their cow is going to be worth when they, worth when they bring it to the mart. They know exactly what they need to produce. And I think that is a, a very, it's one of the big challenges, I suppose, for us to get the message across to the farmers of what it is we want them to produce and how they might go about doing it. And it's putting a market value on the services that high nature value farmland provides. Um, this, is, this is what we're looking for. We're looking for, we're, we're targeting freshwater pearl mussel, but I mean, the benefit, wider benefits include wider biodiversity, water quality, but also carbon. These areas are very uh, carbon rich systems in that, that the soils are, are ca high carbon soils, organic soils. So, I mean, we feel we're delivering for all these three targets through the rollout of our program. Um, so how do you how, how do you assess results? We look at the farmland habitat quality. So we look at grasslands, peatland and scrub. So they're the three typical habitats that occur in farmland in these areas. Uh, we assess the quality of those habitats and come up with a score for each parcel. We also look at floodplain quality. So these are areas along the river that, that flood naturally and whether it's intact or not, that has an influence on the payment because these intact floodplains that haven't been drained are, 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 are very much supporting the freshwater pearl mussel population. So we give a bonus payment on the basis of habit of floodplain quality. Um, we also have to, obviously we can't ignore the water courses, this is the key thing we're looking at here, but we feel that if the habitats are in good condition, the likely runoff coming from those is also likely to be much better 
than if they were improved and heavily fertilized and everything else. But we do look at drains and water courses and we look at the condition of those. And that has an overall um, weighting on the score or the payment due to the farmer. And we also look at the farm and nutrient management on, on the individual farms to address any issues where organic fertilizer or inorganic fertilizer might be getting from the land into the rivers. So these all are taken into consideration in our payment or in our, in our assessment. Uh, as I said, look, we've uh, a score of one to 10 on the individual plots. That's just a, a uh, these scorecards are available on our website, but this is a peatland scorecard where we have a series of questions. The first one there is in relation to habit or species, uh, indicator species, species that would indicate good quality habitat. Uh, there's vegetation structure, and then there's also the hydrological integrity is very important from our point of view. So if a peatland is recently drained or the hydrology is disturbed, that would give rise to a lower score. So there's three sections, ecological integrity, hydrological integrity, and then threats and pressures from, from agriculture. Um, so that we've got three versions of the scorecard, depending on which habitat you're assessing. Uh, the floodplain assessment is quite simple. It's presence or absence of a floodplain. And then it depends on the quality of the habitats within that floodplain as to what the level of payment is. And then the whole farm assessment, which is a, 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 an assessment of all the water courses on the farm. And we look at the risk to water quality on those water courses. So if it's not fenced, if there's no buffer zones, it would score lower than if there was an intact buffer zone or if there was a good, good condition of banks and there wasn't animal access into the water courses to be getting a higher result. So that the whole farm assessment is, is really in relation to the, the water courses and, and, the condition, and the condition of those. Um, just uh, uh, as I said a minute ago, we, we've got a, the, our payment system is that for scores of zero, one, two, and three, we don't issue a payment as we feel that a, a, a plot that's giving rise to such a low score is likely to be contributing negatively to the water environment and the overall biodiversity. So our score is only kick in from four onwards where we feel there's a, 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 an environmental benefit accruing from the management of that plot. And then this, the graph is interesting. We, we, at the end of our program, we'd love most farmers to be getting a score of eight on their plots because this represents high High, uh, high quality habitats, and we want them all to try and get there. So the, the payment curve increases quite a lot there between the six and the seven. So there's that motivation or that incentive to get up to the eight and get up to the high, high quality. That's just an idea of what the, the difference, like it's clear that this here is quite low scoring. It's uh, not going to be getting a payment. Uh, you can see a lot of bare peat in, in uh, bare soil on this photo, it's overgrazed. Obviously, from a water quality perspective, this is very bad also. So it, it will give rise to those uh, sediment runoff and stuff into the rivers. This, on the other hand, is very intact. It's a peatland that's managed uh, extensively, not too much grazing pressure. There will be a small element of grazing, but not a lot. But that will be getting our maximum payment. Um, as I said, this is just a picture of the floodplain. These, these plots here will be getting a floodplain payment and depending on what their habitat score is, the payment varies. If it's a higher score, the floodplain payment gets better because that indicates that it's, it's, it's a better, um, better habitat. Obviously, if a floodplain is intensively managed and it's got nutrients being added there are, uh, in the form of uh, inorganic fertilizer and it's got low scoring habitat, then this is not a good idea to allow these areas to Blood. So it's all about making sure to reward those areas that are appropriately managed on the floodplain. I mentioned the whole farm assessment where we're, this is all about capturing the risk to water quality. So we can't, uh, this is where we look at the individual rivers and streams on the, on the, on the land. This one here would be good quality. They'd be getting a good whole farm result. This one here, you can see there's animals in and out of there. There's a lot of silt being generated. There's probably animal dung and that going into the water course. Therefore, this would be failing the whole farm assessment. So with the whole farm assessment, the key message here is that there's four different results from excellent down to poor. If, you are, if you're getting a thousand euro on your habitat quality, this is weighted according to how your whole farm result is doing. So if your water courses are in perfect condition throughout the farm, you get your you get a bonus top up on your habitat payment. You get it's multiplied by 1.2 if things are excellent, like in the top photo. 
So you get end up getting 1200 euro from your 1000 on your habitat payment. However, if you've got this situation here, and if it's only occurring in a couple of places on the farm, this isn't good enough and you get a, an inadequate whole farm result. That gives rise to only 60% of your habitat payment that gets through to you. So it's about weighting the actual habitat payment because we could easily pay farmers for having fantastic terrestrial habitats. Yet, how do you relate that to water quality? Obviously, we have to capture that through the, the drainage systems on the farm. So that that's how it's captured. If you, you have to try and get the good whole farm result to get your full habitat payment. Uh, the worst result you can get is 0.3, where there's a, a repeated instances of this throughout the farm and you only get 30% of your habitat payment. The big thing about this is that by applying this method, there's a big incentive for the farmer to address the issues that are giving rise to the low score on the water quality. So if it's an issue like this here, where there's animals getting in and out, something as simple as a fence could solve that problem or uh, redirecting the animals or providing a crossing point or something. But some capital measure that might be a one-off uh, investment could solve that problem. And all of a sudden they'd see a very big jump in their payment from one year to the next of 40%. So I think that's how we reward fixing these kind of problems or motivating the farmers to actually fix these problems on the farm. It's a hybrid approach. So we do have the results-based payment, which I've just kind of described there. You've got your habitat quality, your whole farm result, and that's your final payment. But we also have the supporting actions payment where a farmer, if, I, if like I said a minute ago, they need a bit of fencing, they can apply for funding from us for that one-off measure. We will co-fund it with the farmer and so it'll they'll get the, the the capital investment paid for by us but then the objective of this is that their results-based payment should go up the following year so it's like a, it's like a tablet or a medicine that they're taking once off they don't get addicted to having to do measures every year if the measures aren't required so it's about getting them onto this results-based payment where they're getting paid for the quality they're producing some farmers might never need supporting actions if they've got an excellently managed farm at the start they could easily just get their results-based payment and continue like they're going and not have to avail of these supporting actions. And it's very flexible. It's up to the farmer if they want to do it or not. We do try and explain to them the advantages of going with these supporting actions and trying to improve their scores, which is, as I said, it's very important to get the messaging to the farmer. This is just an example of how the program works for one 50 hectare farm. There's a variety of habitats here. This is quite typical of the areas you're working in. You might have a couple of very green fields which are intensively managed. You can see here that there is a, a feeding station and that's giving rise to pollution into the river. There is no buffer zone along the river here. However, there are some good scoring habitats up here in some areas with uh, uh, species rich grasslands. There's some peatland that's scoring quite well. So, the habitat quality on this kind of a farm would give would provide three and a half thousand euro to the farmer based on our payment rates. However, because of these issues here with animals in the river and the dung coming off the off the field, he gets a whole farm score of poor, which means that his habitat payment is reduced down to one third. So he's only getting a thousand euro for as a payment for the way the farm is being managed today. However, if they change their management on the farm to improve things, following advice from us or from their own agricultural advisor, we'd hope they might put in a bit of fencing here, move the feeding station away from the river, and maybe change the management of these drains so that the water's flowing off slower, so we're slowing the flow and allowing vegetation established within the, within the, within the drains. That's all positive, and that reduces the impacts on the river. So if they were to do these few measures within a year or two, we'd expect their whole farm result to go up to good or even excellent. And the effect of that basically is their whole farm going from 0.3 to 1.2 potentially, if they were to achieve what is what's in the graphic here. And their payment would go from 1,000 to 4,000 within a couple of years. And that's an annual payment. So I think the big thing for us is to get the message across there that look, if you do these few measures on the farm, which we will co-fund, your payment, your annual payment will could increase from 1,000 euro up to 4,000 euro. And all of a sudden they're, they're very much being uh, safeguarding the water quality on the farm and the habitats and stuff are still maintained and even enhanced. And that's just the inclusion of these buffer zones and that are important in these areas that are intensively managed. Patrick, uh, I, I see that you have quite a number of slides left. Uh, maybe you could pick some 
that you, yeah. you find very important as uh, to learn from. Yeah. I think that's the, the main part of the of the presentation is what I wanted to concentrate on is, is finished now. So the, the rest now will be quite quick. Um, we do work with a lot of advisors with 61 trained advisors. These are private advisors working throughout the country. So they deliver the program for us. They, they assess the results in the farms and send them to us. Um, we have training for them every year and they have to be approved to be able to work on the program. It's up to the farmer who he nominates as his advisor, but they have to work very closely with the farmer. Um, also, farmer training, as I said, it's very important. We train them every year. Unfortunately, with COVID-19, we weren't able to do it this year. But the very common questions of these training courses, which I think tells us that they're starting to get the messages, they want to know what their score is, what's it worth to me, what can I do, and everything else. And so it's, um, I, this is a very, something I really need to emphasize in these results-based programs, the importance of engaging with farmers. These are just some examples of some supporting actions that I mentioned where a farmer can do fencing or drain blocking, which is kind of peatland restoration in some of these areas is important to slow the flow. Uh, beat plugs. Um, so these are just some of the capital works that we fund. Uh, this is where there's a, a, a ditch coming down here, giving rise to sediment into the river. We ask them to slow the flow by putting in these little weirs, the wooden weirs, and that slows the flow and this would improve their whole farm result, which should improve their payment. So this, this is just those, some of those examples of those actions being put in. Um, that's a water course crossing. Uh, you can see the river right next to it here, but this is what it would have been initially and we'd be looking at something like this to solve the problem. It's very much up to the farmer to find the solution here. If they, if they don't care how he does it, it's a matter of if we go out and the good result is good, your payment is good. We don't care how you get the result to that, but as long as it's not anything crazy. Um, a big part of our program, the difficulty with it is we have 350 or 450 farmers. We're a small team, so data management is very important. Getting the results through from our um, from the advisors, you know, on each we have more than two and a half thousand farms or two and a half thousand fields that we had to get scored this year on the scorecard system. So we've developed a mobile app for that purpose and they upload the data from the field to us and then that's that's we determine the calculations and the, the payments after that. We then audit a number of the farms afterwards to make sure that it all makes sense. Um, that's just the scorecards. It's in, the first year we worked with paper forms, but this is much more efficient and it's much uh, much uh, much improved this year with the in inclusion of uh, the mobile app. Just progress to date. I think this is my last slide. Uh, we issued about 600,000 results payments in year one, which is last year. We had about 300 farmers. This year, we have a 50% increase in the number of farmers and our payment rates, because we know now what our budgets are, it's a bit, we, we expect our payments to go up quite a lot. We'll probably be paying out more than a million euro this year. Uh, it's one of the problems with these results-based programs is you never know what it's going to cost you next year. So it's, uh, it's we're starting to get a clearer idea of that. We have 34,000 hectares of land. 84% of the farmers in these areas came into the program. It's very much a voluntary program. We didn't have the same difficulties that I mentioned about trying to recruit farmers. They're, they were very pop. This was very popular amongst the farmers to come into something like this. And I think what got the message across was the fact that it was locally adapted and there was someone at the end of the phone to answer their queries and stuff. They weren't dealing with a state department in Dublin. They're dealing with a local office and all that. Um, all farmers have stayed in the program. They can pull out if they're not happy. Happy, but uh, they've all, I think, an indication of how they, how it's popular with farmers is that we've had 100% of our farmers have stayed in. It's very much a flexible thing. They, if, if they decide to stay in the program but don't want to do any work or don't want to improve, well, they'll just get their payment what it's due. So I don't see this as being an obstacle at all towards getting farmers in. It's not costing them anything to be in the program, and the worst that can happen is they get a small payment. So I think that that's kind of a message we want to put across. That's it. We feel that something like this could be rolled out at a wider scale and you can, we've kind of shown that we think we can adapt the results based model to any target really, but in these landscapes is very much the freshwater pearl mussel and water quality. Um, but there's obviously climate benefits, flood mitigation and everything else as well coming out of this. Um, so that's it. I think the next round of CAP will be interesting. We're hoping that there might be a future for our program or even an expansion of our program throughout other areas in Ireland. 
Thank you. I hope I wasn't trying to give you too much information there. Yeah, thank you, Patrick, so much. Uh, can, can you now switch to the chat box? Probably I will not read out uh, all the comments. Maybe you can scan quickly and... and <laughs> sure, sure. And so the, the first question starts from Finland by Mikko. It's about the drainage. That the drainage has double, double objective. It, uh... Yeah, uh, we also need flow slowing structures like wetlands and floodplains. I, I think from Mikko there, it's, it's more a comment rather than a, a real question. Yeah. yeah. Um, from Elizabeth, do you take into it's account about, yeah, whether the climate change and where how it affects the, the 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 habitat quality? Whether this is like an external externality, uh, whether you consider it as well? Um, I they say, yeah, uh, like I, I think climate change is yet to. Uh, we don't see any clear evidence of uh, climate change affecting the habitat quality of the of the habitats we're assessing in these areas. They're extremely wet areas and, and the droughts aren't sufficient to cause a deterioration in the habitats yet in a way. Um, mm -hmm. So we, we haven't really need to take that into account. Um, I, I mentioned the external factors and the idea of forestry and other land uses potentially having an effect on the water quality. So we've we've taken that into account by kind of weighting it on the terrestrial habitats and then weighting that on what the, the water quality and stuff or what the how the water courses are managed on the farm. Um, the habitat score is is clearly is yeah it is and the, the scorecards have been designed to make it traceable to imagined activities carried out on the far on the farm. There are some plots like just due to the um, to maybe historical management or due to the topography or what, or the natural capacity of the soil or past management that it might never get a score of ten. Some of these, their maximum might be a score of seven or eight, but we have designed it in such a way that most plots should be able to achieve a score of seven or eight. But ultimately we can't, we have to keep the best payment for the highest quality habitat. So something like in the foreground here would be getting the highest payment, but that would represent a 10 out of 10. A farmer getting a seven or an eight out of 10 would still get a good enough payment, but it, it wouldn't be the optimum um, condition of the habitat. Um, is there a result-based factor on the program? Uh, I mean, that through monitoring the ecosystem and most populations and regions, the effect in terms of exposed or sources. Um, yeah, I, I suppose just to start the last bit first, I suppose it is a key indicator species for the for freshwater habitats, and it's an umbrella species in that if freshwater pearl mussel is doing well, well then everything else is going to fall into place. That that, that this this species does not survive well in modified landscapes or, or uh, poorly, poorly or degraded uh, ecosystems. Um, the monitoring, so I suppose monitoring, the great thing about these results-based programs as well is that a lot of the monitoring is built into the assessment of the program. So from year to, from year mm -hmm. and year, we can tell how weather scores are going up. That would mean habitat quality is going up. Uh, similarly, the water courses and stuff the way we monitor them. Now we do look at, um, we do have a further monitoring going on with the catchments in the areas where water quality and that is is being monitored by other agencies. And we do intend to be looking at that over the lifetime of our program to see whether there's been any changes or not. But water quality is exceptionally difficult to relate back to what's happening on the individual farms or whether it's our program or what has given rise to the improvement. But it's certainly something we'd hope to see some trend because we would be the dominant land use in these areas. Um, I think with the, the bonus or the ex post reward, I, um, I, I, Lena had a, a good comment earlier about this whole catchment um, bonus that we'd like to test something whereby if we're working in sub catchment where agriculture is the only show in town or where everyone in that sub catchment is in our program that we'd look at maybe the average scores across the farms and give a, a bonus payment based on the, the overall score of that sub catchment. So we're thinking about something like that where we'd reward um, cooperation and high and high high achievements within within areas. 
Um, how is the program integrated with other EU's with the EU subsidy scheme? Does it come on top of the agri environment scheme? Yeah, so in Ireland, there's a, a measures based agri environment scheme called GLOSS, and it, this is a top of it. This is a payment on top of that. Now, some of our payments, like um, on our grasslands, the payment we give to farmers who are in the agri environment scheme who are also getting paid for that habitat, we have to give them a reduced payment on, on that plot ourselves. But generally, it doesn't have a big effect on the overall farm because we feel that we're paying way above and beyond what the, um, or they're delivering way above and beyond what's required of the agri environment scheme. So it is, it, it comes in on top, but those farmers that are contributing the agri environment scheme are slightly reduced payment on the basis that uh, to avoid the potential for double payment. Um, I can, uh, Frank, there's one you about the PowerPoint. I have no problem. I can send you a PDF maybe of the PowerPoint afterwards and you can distribute. Oh yeah, you said that. <laughs> <laughs> you don't get the nutrient balance in the field. If you have a good yield, there is a smaller leaching risk to the, the river. Um, yeah, we, we, do, we don't look at the individual nutrient balance on individual plots. We, we do look at, um, I, I suppose, you can see from the photographs there, it's very extensively managed. Um, the, the problem, we've looked at the idea of maybe looking at P index of soils and relate the payment to that and stuff, but it's quite difficult to do that. And we haven't found a, a, a robust way of doing it. And it would add an awful lot to the administration budget as well on the program. So we feel that the, the, the habitat scores do reflect the nutrient status of the plots and that if there's, extensive ryegrass and there's um, there's low species diversity which comes with a lot of nutrient inputs you're not going to be getting a high score on that so it does reflect that um, but yeah it is something that we're, we're, we're still trying to capture some of this nutrient management one of the things we do look at is the problem here is that farmers have been driven by agriculture policy in recent decades towards housing cattle over the winter time and then you get a lot of organic manure that needs to be spread on the land. Looking at the photograph in front of you, do you see any land that's suitable for spreading that organic manure? There's not. And generally it's only maybe one or two plots on every farm might have land that's suitable for spreading organic fertilizer. And even then there's a big risk that that'll get into the water quality because of the wet environment and the, the soil types and stuff being, being, um, being not very permeable so it's um that's the biggest pressure we have when it comes to nutrient management is the extent of uh, organic manure being generated and not enough land to take that in a in a way that it won't give rise to risk to water quality so we do have an index that we we look at the extent of suitable lands that the farmer has and we relate that to the amount of animals he over houses over winter and there's an index there that we we it contributes to the whole farm results it's a little bit complicated but it, it's to capture that issue where a farmer clearly has too many cattle housed over winter that he doesn't have the land suitable for spreading on it the assumption is well the excess nutrients must be getting into the river and, and that that's not that's not good um how extensive is the monitoring do you monitor each farm so they maintain the declared scores at the moment we're monitoring we're assessing farms every year uh, we work with advisors who kind of act as a as a go-between between, between us, the project team, which is quite small. We deal with the advisors, and the advisors deal with the farmer. And I think from an out, uh, a wider upskilling of advisors, it's a very good uh, framework, and that the advisors all of a sudden are getting familiar with how to look at ecological quality and assess it and and everything else. So um, they monitor, yeah, they monitor the farms every year. Uh, we do in some areas of more mountainous land, we just do it every second year. Sorry, just. <laughs> um, so yeah, some of the more mountainous lands we feel every second year is sufficient. Um, so that's it, yeah, I hope that answers all your questions. <laughs> yeah, uh, there is also, um, yeah, um, uh, as I spotted uh, from one of your slides, uh, this uh, advising uh, or counseling is, is rather extensive. Um, it's, uh, it's about seven, eight advisors per, per each of the participating uh, farmer. Um, Sorry? So it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's quite, a, quite a great uh, contribution to, to the program and the project. Do you envisage that 
this is just because of this extra governmental support uh, it's possible or or this is rather established uh, system that you have in Ireland uh, I mean in terms of the the share of advices per, per farmers yeah um well we have uh we've trained 60 advisors there's probably about 12 advisors who are working on a, multiple farms on a lot of farms there's some advisors and we find this is one of the things we're trying to um improve maybe in the program is some advisors might only have two or three farmers in the program and we find that those advisors need a lot more support and help because they're not as familiar and they might only score two or three farms in the year so they take a lot of input from ourselves to train them up and everything to, for our benefit i think it'd be easier if we were working with lower number of advisors and we could keep a, have a better standard maybe at, across that but that reflects the fact that our catchments are so dispersed throughout the country as well that there's not a, a big enough market i suppose for some of the farm advisors to be that interested in getting more farmers um but yeah we've trained up 60 but there might be maybe 30 are active and then maybe about 12 are working on on most of the farms someone's asked uh what's the background of the advisors they're agricultural graduates typically they would have had some agri-environmental training through different agri-environment schemes in the past but these advisors um they'd be professionals working in the area uh and most of their work each year would be just advising farmers on their basic payment returns and that kind of stuff. So this is quite different for them. So they do need a, a bit of training to get them up to up to speed. But we've designed the whole scorecard to make it very much understandable for the non-specialist. And I think that's important for the farmer as well, that they can understand what it is that's being scored and how they can improve the score. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Patrick, for your interesting presentation. And, and I'm, I'm sure it uh, inspired many of us and, and provoked also further discussions uh, so thank okay. you so much at the moment uh, okay. and we will now uh, come back to the to, to the overseas to ireland to the to, to europe uh, austria and i would like to give floor to elizabeth uh, and and to introduce uh, us uh, the system that has been uh, applied in in uh, in austria so the floor is yours elizabeth please Hello everybody, um, I'm happy to share some Austrian experience on the implementation of result-based approaches. I try to share my screen now. Uh, do you well, does it work? Yeah, okay. Yeah, does, um, yes. <laughs> perfect. I'm working at the Austrian Ministry of Agriculture in the Department of Agri-Environmental Programs and Organic Agriculture. I'm, for myself, I'm a, an ecologist and I'm in charge for biodiversity issues. Um, we are implementing result-based approaches within the agri-environmental program in this period and I will also give you some experiences of that. But before I start uh, with the result-based approaches, I want to give you some background information about the Austrian agriculture and about our environmental status and about the implementation of the CAP. So Austria, uh, we have around 20 hectares uh and is the average size of our farms so it's it's quite small uh, compared to other european countries we have around 110,000 farms all over austria and what's um typical or characteristic for austria is that the cap payments they contribute to a high sh they have a high share on the farm income because we have a lot of uh, less favored areas in Austria. We have a lot of mountain areas, around three quarters of our area is so-called less favored areas. So the farmers, they strongly depend on subsidies. Um, that's also why we have a, a high comment in participating in the agri-environmental program. About 80% of our farmers are participating in this program 
which takes us among the it's the the almost the highest participation with all over Europe. And uh, we also have a strong nature conservation measure where we encourage encourage the farmers to protect species rich grasslands. Um, this nature conservation measure about 70% uh, of all the farmers are taking part. Uh, basically, we have a quite good environmental situation in Austria, uh, but we do have also like other EU member states, we do have uh, environmental problems like uh, we see a decline in our biodiversity indicators, for example, the farmland bird index declined about 40% in the last decades or high nature value farmland constantly, constantly declines. We also have in the areas where we have an intensive agricultural use, where we have a lot of arable land that we have also uh, issues like water pollution or soil erosion. Uh, now a few words to the implementation of the cap. In Austria, we are a so-called second pillar country. So we, we have um, two thirds of the cap payments they are spent for rural development measures. Uh, you see on this uh, graph that within the rural development uh, program, we have a high focus or a strong focus on area related measures. We have the agri-environment measure, the organic farming measure, the animal welfare measure, and these three measures, they, uh, they are building the agri-environmental program. We also have a high share of, of less favored area payments and around uh, two thirds of the uh, rural development payments are spent for area related measures. Our agri-environmental program consists of 24 different measures aiming at the protection of soils, climate, biodiversity and water bodies. And within this, um, agri-environment program, we have this nature conservation measure, and there we introduced in the uh, current programming period, we introduced a pilot project, which is called the result-based nature conservation plan. Um, yeah, I will. we started this result-based nature conservation plan in 2014. Uh, it was developed by a consultancy a consultant agency uh, and we started with 16 farms all over Austria. So far uh, we have 150 farms participating all over Austria. You see them, you see these green spots. So you see there's, uh, they are distributed all over Austria and there can also be some linkage observed with Natura 2000 areas. Um, what's the key of our result-based nature conservation plan? Uh, next to the, the, to the nature conservation goals, like we want to have species rich grasslands, for example, or we want to have the presence of endangered species on agricultural areas, or we want to just to improve the ecological status of an agricultural area, that's, that's the main uh, nature conservation goals, we also have, we know them from our uh, area related measures. Uh, but the, the special thing about the result based approaches is the educational objectives. We also have, uh, uh, we want to increase the farmers knowledge about nature conservation concerns and we want them to understand them we want them to understand the needs of habitats and species, and we want them to know the effects uh, which the management activities have on the parcels. So we also have a strong focus on information and advisory, and therefore we, we built up um, advisory teams of ecologists, the vegetation ecologists, and and also uh, animal ecologists who are advising the farmers. So every farmer participating 
in this measure is visited on the spot and the ecologist takes together with the farmer a closer look at the participating area. So the ecologists define together with the farmers a specific objectives, environmental objectives for the parcels. And for example, this, these objectives could also be influenced by the interest of the farmer. If the farmer is interested in spiders or in insects or in certain plant species, then it, this is taken into consideration of, by the de definition of the goals. A classical objective could be the presence of, a certain, of certain plant species or the presence of certain animals, or um, for example, the establishment of a breeding pair of winchet. Um, and besides these objectives, we also define control criteria because control criteria, um, they are the basis for the on-the-spot checks. So the, the, and in our opinion, these uh, environmental objectives we define on the spot, uh, they are also influenced by external effects like for example, climate or if there's a mild winter and they have not, uh, they're not only influenced by the management activities the farmer is implementing on the parcel. So we have this control criteria with, which have a high causal relationship to management measures, which are quantifiable and verifiable. And uh, these control criteria are also the basis for the, on the spot checks and the, the farmers are sanctioned if they don't uh, fulfill or if they, if they don't achieve this control criteria. And uh, typical control criteria is, for example, the presence of a vegetation structure or the minimum vegetation height, for example, on a certain date. Uh, there, I have an example for a result-based approach on, on the grassland. For example, um, the objective for this parcel level is, is a successful breeding of two pairs of winchet. I hope you all know the winchets, they are ground breeding grassland birds and uh, they need a certain vegetation height for their as nesting habitats and they have a problem with the uh, increasing intensification of, of lowland hay meadows in Austria. So they they have difficulties to find suitable nesting habitats. And uh, on this parcel, the objectives for, for the winchet were uh, the establishment of a breeding, of two breeding pairs of winchet and the availability of, of suitable nesting habitats on at least 15% of the parcel. Um, there were also, we took drawings to, to explain the farmer, um, to give him additional information and advice um, how he can identify uh, nesting winchets and how he makes sure that nesting habitats are built in those parts he moves later, so after the mid of June, because the, the winchets are breeding between March and June. And the control criteria is that at least 5% of the vegetation must be higher than 40 centimeters on the parcel until the mid of June. So that's the, the control criteria the, for the control authority. Um, so to sum our approach up, uh, we have this area objectives for the for the land parcel. Besides, we have the control criteria as basis for the for the control. Um, the advisory and information is very important. And with with this information, we uh, give the farmers the the flexibility to implement the management measures which best fit for them and which they think will fit the best. And we, we want the farmers to learn in terms of objectives and results. And we also, I forgot to 
to say that we also provide him with the information about different management options. And all this information as uh, we provide the farmer uh, is written down into a logbook. It's a personalized farmer's logbook and uh, he can read this or, or yeah, it's, it's a lot of documentary effort also for the farmer, which he's paid for. Next, we come to the <laughs> premium calculation. Uh, we don't have this uh, a result based premium calculation like the Ireland approach. We have um, an action based premium calculation. So we pay the farmers um, based on, or we pay them based on the, on the management activities they are carrying out on the participating areas. So for example, if the participating area is a wetland meadow, then we assume that he's mowing this wetland meadow only once a year and there's a renouncement of fertilizers on this uh, meadow. And so he gets paid for the income foregone he has because of this extensive management. Uh, we have a list uh, for these management requirements um, for the payments we have uh, in our agroenvironmental program. Uh, for example, we pay him 300 euros for mowing the meadow only once a year. We pay him another 80 euro for, for not uh, fertilizing the meadow and we pay him another 70 euros for the uh, increased planning effort he has. So the, the area for the premiums for these result-based approaches are around 400 to six or seven, even 700 euros per hectare each year. So uh, what are our conclusions and lessons learned for result-based programs in the up, for the upcoming period? Um, we learned that these result-based approaches are a great deal of administration efforts and they also they, uh, cause a high cost for administration. So you have these uh, advisory services and on-site visits for each farm by ecologists. You have the farmer's logbook he has to uh, periodically uh, document. The, the efforts, uh, but the educational component is also a great strength of this effort. And we learned that farmers who are well informed about the, the species of uh, living in their fields, that they feel more responsible for, uh, for a good environmental status of the fields. And this is also an, an sustainable impact. Uh, we also learned that result-based programs or approaches are not really suitable for large-scale large -scale programs, but in our opinion, they are well suitable for, for focused and training-oriented agro-environment measures. It's perfect for farmers who are well-informed, who are interested in environmental protection and who are committed to ecological management activities. Uh, what we also learned with the result-based nature conservation plan is that it's perfect for dynamic agricultural areas like fellow area areas on arable land with a lot of rural uh, ruderal species which are mobile. So because the farmer has the flexibility to choose which management option would fit best. So he, he's not uh, the measure oriented approach is, is not so flexible. And it's also uh, very suitable for the regeneration, for example, of, of habitats. So it's also a kind of dynamic uh, development. Uh, so let's take a look at the future cap. Um, we see that uh, the European Commission recognized the potential of, of result-based payments to 
meet environmental objectives. You see it in the EU biodiversity strategy where it is stated that result-based payment schemes should provide a significant contribution to meet biodiversity goals. And um, the result-based payments are also recommended in the CAP strategic plans. Uh, for example, in article, article 65 and article 28, the eco schemes and agro-environmental programs, um, the, the implementation of result-based approaches is recommended, uh, but not obligatory, but it's they, they recommended. Uh, we are, I will give you some information what we are planning for the upcoming period. Um, we want to further develop this result-based nature conservation plan. We want to expand it. <laughs> Uh, we want to have an independent agri-environment measure, which is called result-based management, because now it's attached to the nature conservation measure, but in the next period, we want to detach it and make an own, create an own uh, measure. We aim at the participation of from 500 to 1,000 farmers. If you remember now, we have 150 farmers, and we want to extend these measures to other protected assets. So now we have only the biodiversity uh, component, but we want to extend it to the assets, soil and climate. And therefore we, um, uh, a corresponding rural development project has been submitted in order to develop the content related design and the technical implementation. Um, it's the same agency who uh, introduced the result-based nature conservation plan. So they are, they are in contact with the farmers, they know about the lessons learned and, and they have ideas how to, to extend this uh, measure. Uh, they want to... Uh, further develop the list of indicators and they want to develop, um, for example, in terms of biodiversity, uh, we focused uh, on plant species or animal species and uh, they want to make a shift to focus more on structures than on species. For example, if you have um, different herbs within a parcel then it's, or if you have a, a different uh, vegetation hate within a grassland area, then it's also also uh, an indicator for species richness. Because farmers, we made the experience that farmers have difficulties to identify to identify species if they are not flowering, and so this this would be an alternative uh, approach. We also want to simplify administration and therefore we uh, want to develop uh, a digital tool like an app with a stored database where all the indicators are listed and where the farmers can also do their documentaries. Um, and by this uh, simplification of administration, we, we want to lower the costs for the result-based approach. Uh, as we know that the education component is a, is a great strength of our result-based approach, we want to continue and even enhance the educational offer. And uh, next to, to this training-oriented result-based approach, we also try to implement a broad uh, result-based approach in Austria with, within an area-wide um, agricultural, agro-environmental measure, uh, which aims at the preservation of permanent grassland in productive areas. So uh, farmers can take part in this measure with, with uh, permanent grassland with a slow, with a slow, with a low slope gradient, which is um, less 
or lower than 18% at with a high productivity index, um, more than 20. And uh, we, within this, it's, it will be a so-called, a top-up, which is called species-rich grassland. And um, farmers have to, uh, they, they have a five indicator species, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> um, at least five indicator species associated with extensive management uh, should be present as, at the participating parcels. And typical indis, indicator species would be, for example, Campanula, Bartula, or Crepis B. Um, I don't know the English names, but they are typical um, individuals or species of uh, lowland hay meadows. So um, the farmers, they have to to prove that presence of five of these five indicator plants and then a list of, of possible indicator plants is currently being developed by a research agency in Austria. And what's, what will be important is the evenly distribution of this indicator plant. So it, it's not sufficient that there's only one or two indicator plants. <laughs> or one or two plants of each, each species on the meadow. And uh, the farmers should also make sure that the indicator species are blooming so that they can spread their seeds. And yeah, it's the same. Uh, we want the farmer to, to use their own knowledge and skills to achieve the goals. And therefore, we also offer them compulsory training. And um, this measure, the farmers can dearly apply for these measures, so it's not uh, like our other environment, agri-environment measures, it's not a, a f at least five-year lasting measure, but it's a yearly measure and we are uh, thinking about uh, implementing it within the eco-schemes also, because it's, it's this yearly uh, approach. So... Thanks a lot for your attention. And yeah, <laughs> I'm curious about your questions. Yeah, thank, thank you so much, Elizabeth. There are a couple of questions in the, in the chat box, uh, if you don't mind. Uh, do you see them? Yes. Mm -hmm. The first one is by, by Justus uh, about uh, the most popular agri-environmental measures in, uh, in your uh, program. And, uh, and how the, the farmers are motivated. Uh, mm -hmm. um, yeah. The most popular agri-environment measure is the organic farming measure. We have around 25% of our areas managed organically. And I think the main motivator for farmers is the money <laughs> they get or the payments they receive. Um, but we also try to, to encourage them. There's a shift because the advisory is getting more and more important and we are trying to, to encourage them to take up measures because of, of environmental benefits. But um, due to, to this high share of, of mountain areas in Austria, we, we have this dependence on subsidies. So a lot of farmers, are taking up these measures from the beginning just to survive. And now they are learning more and more about the environment impact. So they are, they are getting proud of, of the environmental uh, goods they deliver. Mm -hmm. uh, their next question is about what the farmers do with the harvested biomass. Where does this go? Is it uh, for fodder or is it for uh, energy or what, what do you do about it? Uh, I, in the, mostly it's for fodder and I don't think for energy because it's, it's a, a low energy output from, from grassland. Mm -hmm. So um, we have a lot of uh, live 
stock and, and extensive livestock management in Austria. Also a lot of uh, suckling cows, I guess it's, it's in English, uh, mm. grazing animals. And so the traditional uh, farming system still is still uh, remaining in mm. Austria. Then there is a question about uh, who pays for the advice. Is it the farmer or, uh, or the state? The state pays for the advice. Okay. So the, the farmers are paid for getting, for, <laughs> for attending the advice. And the state is paying for the, for the ecologists. And the farmers are, get, are getting these uh, additional uh, payments for, um, for this planning effort they have and for the, the advisory they have to mm -hmm. attend. Mm -hmm. Then there is a question about uh, the next uh, CAP program. You said that the soil and climate and biodiversity will be, will be addressed. Uh, there's a question about water. Would water be a uh, special attention in the program as well? Um, we thought about uh, also involving water, but we are not sure how to handle <laughs> this. I think uh, we, we are struggling now with climate and soils and we are searching for good indicators and maybe water would be the next step in Austria, mm -hmm. but we don't have so much water issues now. So we, we don't have, we don't really have pollution problems. So, so it's not so urgent. We have mm -hmm. this climate issue and uh, the building up of uh, the, the humus uh, formation is, is the, the bigger problem now or the, yeah. Mm -hmm. And there is a question about whether you also apply any, any actions at catchment uh, level or, or jointly between the, the farmers as well. Collective approaches. No, we, we didn't, uh, implement this in, in Austria, it's, it's a very interesting approach and we are thinking about it, but, but so far we didn't, uh, I don't know, we, we didn't have the motivation to, <laughs> to implement this. Farmers, we, uh, it's no history for collective approaches in Austria, but maybe this, I hope it, it will change in future. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, thank you so much, um, uh, Elizabeth, uh, <laughs> for joining us and, and uh, having the time to share your, your ideas and your experiences and lessons learned uh, uh, because we are all learning from each other. And uh, since we are working in the Baltic Sea uh, region, it's very refreshing to also to learn what's happening outside of the region. And today we have learned about the Irish case and now the Austrian, Austrian experiences. So I think this has been very valuable to, to us. But I would, uh, I would also like to now for the remaining uh, minutes uh, also to, uh, to, to raise some of the issues that I picked up uh, from today's uh, workshop um, uh, regarding the result-based uh, approach. Uh, uh, first of all, I noted down that uh, it requires uh, quite, uh, uh, and also it develops, and this is a very positive thing as well, that uh, we would have a very detailed and personalized, I would say, uh, data on, on the fields uh, from different uh, uh, categories uh, and um, so the, the data has become really <laughs> a very crucial issue. Uh, we have uh, developed a very good uh, uh, GIS plans even in the uh, 2 and 3 D uh, uh, approaches and the digital data is, uh, is, is really uh, becoming uh, more accessible and uh, not only for the researchers but uh, but the farmers. 
And so the personalized data is, is uh, very much becoming as a allotment based or, or field based already. Uh, and uh, as far as the result-based um, approach is concerned, then, then it requires a kind of uh, measuring system. And uh, we have been learning today that this point system and scorecard system have been, uh, have been used. Then uh, the monitoring uh, is is uh, is a very uh, important uh, part of the uh, the, um, the system, and and also the control uh, and how to make both of them not very uh, demanding in terms of the the resources, uh, and but probably we can't avoid it very much because um, as we learn today uh, we need. Uh, more experienced and qualified advisors. Uh, we need ecologists, biology, uh, biologists uh, to, uh, to um, be in place and, uh, and uh, both in the monitoring and in the control um, part of the, the approach. And uh, how to, to motivate the farmers? This is a, a key question, how to how to um, uh, bring them along, how to engage them and, uh, and make these uh, measures and, uh, and uh, payments uh, really uh, usable and, and interesting for them. Uh, I also picked from, from uh, your presentation, Elizabeth, and, uh, and, and also from Patrick, Mm, that uh, probably it's uh, the result-based payment system uh, is uh, perhaps more suitable uh, in, a, in a more focused or targeted areas rather than having a countrywide uh, um, large-scale approach. Maybe I was wrong, but, uh, but just uh, correct me then. So there are quite a lot of uh, challenges uh, uh, related to this uh, uh, application of the result-based payment. But on the other hand, as you pointed out yourself in your presentations, Patrick and Elizabeth, that it also provides a, a very good possibility uh, to uh, become more knowledgeable, to spread this knowledge among the, the farmers uh, and, uh, and to, to let them know what's happening in their uh, fields and, and in the water bodies uh, that they, uh, they uh, are farming or they affect what are their neighbors doing. Uh, so um, there, are, there is much to explore and, and practice. And I hope that the, also the, the good, good um, results and, uh, and the lessons uh, will be tested in, in the Baltic Sea region as well. Uh, now I'm, I'm uh, also um, asking uh, people watching us uh, the, the online webinar and also the speakers, if you, if you will, uh, do you have any, any uh, other things that I missed out or, or maybe misinterpreted? Uh, do you have any other re reflections on the, on the subject? So now you're welcome to, to share with us. Please, please come forward. Yeah, hello. Uh, I'm uh, Nerius from another project, uh, Interact Desire. <laughs> So just uh, my, uh, I was uh, asked asked to join this uh, seminar, and in fact, it is very interesting uh, to look at the variety of measures and uh, measures based on the result. And in fact, um, also we in our project we are looking only on peatlands, uh, not not so broad like you are, but I mean we still have to can learn a lot of things which are then uh, implemented in in other countries and not invent a, a wheel, but already learn from existing uh, experiences. Well, that's my uh, just uh, so, such a comment. Okay, thank you. Any, any other 
reflections uh, or questions or Yes. Hello, Frank from Denmark. <laughs> I think uh, I like the, how you look at the things in Ireland. It's very pragmatic. Do something. And uh, not everything should be in a scheme. But what makes sense out there, I, re I really like that idea. That was my comment. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Frank. <laughs> Anybody else would like to? Yeah, if I may. Yes, please, Sandra. Yeah, Sandra, I'm uh, from Latvia. And uh, actually, during the workshop, we already, already a little bit discussed with colleagues the uh, first impressions, and, and there are two things uh, about uh, Estonia. We are uh, really interested in your. Um, approach uh, to, to find a way how to motivate uh, to look for the ways how to motivate really uh, farmers in the places where there is a lack of biodiversity and, and this is what we also have to uh, search or study a little bit more in Latvia and also uh, just uh, importance of good advice was very much uh, stressed by the by all presenters i would say and uh, this is really important also uh, if we want to achieve some result yeah uh, money is a motivator for farmers but really always needed some um, support from professional advisors who goes out to the field and, and work individually or in a groups, but this uh, direct contact, uh, uh, contact and direct support is uh, way, uh, the um, way which will lead to the result, I would say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for very good seminar, Kaya. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, are there any? Any hands up? <laughs> yes, Patrick, please. Hi. Um, I, I, it's, is there anyone uh, that's, are you working with uh, Evelina at all, Kaya, or do you know the background to her work? Uh, yes, yes, I do, yes. Uh, we, yeah. Yeah. She, seemed, she seemed to mention, like, it, it strikes me that she has a lot of the work done and that uh, she has her system of assessing quality and it's a shame that that isn't being used to determine the, the farmer payment or related to the payment. Um, it seems that there's a lot of uh, pushback or kind of um, the farmers aren't that uh, motivated to get involved in something like this. Do, do you think there's any particular reason for that? Is, is there a way of delivering the message better or something? We find that a lot of our farmers are quite interested in the concept that, you know, there's potential to improve here once they, once they learn a bit of background to it. Uh, just my, my personal uh, response would be that, yeah, it, it takes time and, and, and we, I do yourself and this a little bit have, have emphasized that uh, you, you need also this uh, support system and, uh, and engagement and communicating and advising from the, the donors. So, uh, this, is, uh, this is very important. It could go hand in hand with that. Uh, with the ecological knowledge uh, that is uh, being uh, produced by the ecologists. Uh, and, and of course, uh, uh, the third party, the authorities, we need to also pick up uh, on the on the, on the, on the scientific knowledge. And, and I'm not sure if it's just my connection, but it was very difficult to hear you. Um. Okay. Yeah, some problems is a noise for everybody, I think. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, what what I was saying that it's uh, it, uh, it it needs uh, the different. I mean, the action of different uh, actors, uh, the the advisors, uh, uh, the authorities, uh, and and uh, the farmers. Uh, so, in order to 
to put uh, all this in place and it takes time. The, the projects that uh, have been in operation and as Avelina was uh, describing to us, they have been rather recent. So we have this uh, scientific knowledge, but now it has to be uh, communicated and and uh, and implemented, so to speak. So yeah, it, it simply takes time. This is my my perception. It, it seems like the methods she was using is very much uh, remote sensing and uh, maybe GIS related. So you don't know like what their proposal would be with regards to monitoring. Is it? It sounds like it would be a very low cost way of doing it of the assessing rather than us where we send someone out every year to look at the same farm. That. Actually, our uh, our um, paying uh, authority, who is also the control authority, they claim that it will be an immense administrative burden to them. Uh, so, um, uh, so they are they are more or less uh, rejecting this approach. Uh, but uh, you are right, uh, uh, using the remote sensing and. Uh, and uh, so, and, and also even drones, <laughs> uh, the, it can be a solution. But uh, yeah, uh, again, I would say it takes time to adjust uh, the thinking uh, and, and also the, the, the proceedings of, uh, of the authorities as well. Yeah, well, one of the big arguments we have about the results based approach is uh, at least you know what you're getting and you're paying for what you get. A lot of times in the past year we've got prescriptive based measures and every farmer gets the same amount. And it doesn't matter if they do a good job or a bad job or if there's any result at all at the end, mm -hmm. but at least here we can say, well, this is verified. It's absolutely true. This is this is what we're getting for our environmental payment. So, and I mean, from our point of view, we, we find that a lot of the digital type of data recording and stuff reduces the administrative burden an awful lot. And uh, relatively speaking, we find that the administrative costs aren't that much higher uh, on our program than a full um, prescriptive measures based program. Mm -hmm. But now our time is, time is up and uh, let me very much thank you, you Patrick and Elizabeth for your time. I'm also forwarding my thanks to Avelina, uh, although she had to go to lecturing. Uh, but, and also the participants, I, I think, all right, Lisa, I, I hope that everybody got uh, um, something useful uh, and tips uh, from, from the presentations. Uh, uh, for, for their organizations and, and maybe even for the countries. So uh, we will keep an eye on, uh, on this uh, based, uh, uh, approach development anyway, because we have also a Swedish uh, partner in the project, uh, the, the Swedish Agricultural Board and Emma Svensson, uh, who uh, specifically look at the recycling payments in Sweden. And, and then we can also learn from the other countries. But thank you once again for your time uh, and effort, and we very much appreciate that. So thank you, and and uh, hopefully to see you, see you in the near future. Thank you very much, Kaya. Great seminar. Thank you.